We had a bad time of it, he said. Did you get him? Rambo? Yes, finally. Then bring him up. To Freehold? But that's impossible. You don't understand. He's blown his top, he's crazy. They've taken him away to a hospital. You assume too much, Waldo said icily. I know he's crazy, but I meant what I said. Arrange it. Provide nurses. Sign affidavits. Use bribery. Bring him to me at once. It is necessary. You really mean that? I'm not in the habit of jesting. Something to do with your investigations? He's in no shape to be useful to you, I can tell you that. That, pronounced Waldo, is for me to decide. Well, said Stevens doubtfully, I'll try. See that you succeed. Stevens called back thirty minutes later. I can't bring Rambo. You clumsy incompetent. Stevens turned red, but held his temper. Never mind the personalities. He's gone. He never got to the hospital. What? That's the crazy part about it. They took him away in a confining stretcher, laced up like a corset. I saw them fasten him in myself. But when they got there he was gone. And the attendants claim the straps weren't even unbuckled. Waldo started to say, preposterous, thought better of it. Stevens went on. But that's not the half of it. I'd sure like to talk to him myself. I've been looking around his lab. You know that set of decalbs that went nuts the ones that were hexed. I know to what you refer. Rambo's got a second set to doing the same thing. Waldo remained silent for several seconds, then said quietly, Dr. Stevens. Yes. I want to thank you for your efforts. And will you please have both sets of receptors, the two sets that are misbehaving, sent to Freehold at once? There was no doubt about it. Once he had seen them with his own eyes, watched the inexplicable squirming of the antennae, applied such tests as suggested themselves to his mind, Waldo was forced to conclude that he was faced with new phenomena, phenomena for which he did not know the rules. If there were rules. For he was honest with himself. If he saw what he thought he saw, then rules were being broken by the new phenomena, rules which he had considered valid, rules to which he had never previously encountered exceptions. He admitted to himself that the original failures of the decalbs should have been considered just as overwhelmingly upsetting to physical law as the unique behavior of these two, the difference lay in that one alien phenomenon was spectacular, the other was not. Quite evidently Dr. Rambo had found it so, he had been informed that the doctor had been increasingly neurotic from the first instance of erratic performance of the decalb receptors. He regretted the loss of Dr. Rambo. Waldo was more impressed by Rambo crazy than he had ever been by Rambo sane. Apparently the man had had some modicum of ability after all, he had found out something more, Waldo admitted, than he himself had been able to find out so far, even though it had driven Rambo insane. Waldo had no fear that Rambo's experience, whatever it had been, could unhinge his own reason. His own self-confidence was, perhaps, fully justified. His own mild paranoid tendency was just sufficient to give him defenses against an unfriendly world. For him it was healthy, a necessary adjustment to an otherwise intolerable situation, no more pathological than a callous, or an acquired immunity. Otherwise he was probably more able to face disturbing facts with equanimity than 99% of his contemporaries. He had been born to disaster, he had met it and had overcome it, time and again. The very house which surrounded him was testimony to the calm and fearless fashion in which he had defeated a world to which he was not adapted. He exhausted, temporarily, the obvious lines of direct research concerning the strangely twisting metal rods. Rambo was not available for questioning. Very well, there remained one other man who knew more about it than Waldo did. He would seek him out. He called Stevens again. Has there been any word of Dr. Rambo? No word, and no sign. I'm beginning to think the poor old fellow is dead. Perhaps. That which doctor friend of your assistant was Schneider his name. 
Gramps Schneider. Yes indeed. Will you please arrange for him to speak with me? By phone, or do you want to see him in person? I would prefer for him to come here, but I understand that he is old and feeble, it may not be feasible for him to leave the ground. If he is knotted up with space sickness, he will be no use to me. I'll see what can be done. Very good. Please expedite the matter. And, Dr. Stevens. Well. If it should prove necessary to use the phone, arrange to have a portable full stereo taken to his home. I want the circumstances to be as favorable as possible. Okay. Imagine that, Stevens added to McLeod when the circuit had been broken. The great I am's showing consideration for somebody else's convenience. The fat boy must be sick, McLeod decided. Seems likely. This chore is more yours than mine, Mac. Come along with me, we'll take a run over into Pennsylvania. How about the plant? Tell Carruthers he's it if anything blows, we couldn't help it anyway. Stevens mugged back later in the day. Mr. Jones. Yes, doctor. What you suggest can't be arranged. You mean that Schneider can't come to Freehold? I mean that and I mean that you can't talk with him on the view phone. I presume that you mean he is dead. No, I do not. I mean that he will not talk over the view phone under any circumstances whatsoever, to you or to anyone. He says that he is sorry not to accommodate you, but that he is opposed to everything of that nature cameras, cinecams, television, and so forth. He considers them dangerous. I am afraid he is set in his superstition. As an ambassador, Dr. Stevens, you leave much to be desired. Stevens counted up to ten, then said, I assure you that I have done everything in my power to comply with your wishes. If you are dissatisfied with the quality of my cooperation, I suggest that you speak to Mr. Gleason. He cleared the circuit. How would you like to kick him in the teeth? McLeod said dreamily. Mac, you're a mind reader. Waldo tried again through his own agents, received the same answer. The situation was, to him, almost intolerable, it had been years since he had encountered a man whom he could not buy, bully, nor in extremity persuade. Buying had failed, he had realized instinctively that Schneider would be unlikely to be motivated by greed. And how can one bully, or wheedle, a man who cannot be seen to be talked with? It was a dead end no way out. Forget it. Except, of course, for a means best classed as a fate worse than death. No. No, not that. Don't think about it. Better to drop the whole matter, admit that it had him licked, and tell Gleason so. It had been seventeen years since he had been at Earth's surface, nothing could induce him to subject his body to the intolerable demands of that terrible field. Nothing. It might even kill him. He might choke to death, suffocate. No. He sailed gracefully across his shop, an overpadded cupid. Give up this freedom, even for a time, for that torturous bondage? Ridiculous. It was not worth it. Better to ask an acrophobe to climb Half Dome, or demand that a claustrophobe interview a man in the world's deepest mine. Uncle Gus. Oh, hello, Waldo. Glad you called. Would it be safe for me to come down to Earth? Eh? How's that? Speak up, man. I didn't understand you. I said would it hurt me to make a trip down to Earth. This hookup, said Grimes, is terrible. It sounded just like you were saying you wanted to come down to Earth. That's what I did say. What's the matter, Waldo? Do you feel all right? I feel fine, but I have to see a man at Earth's surface. There isn't any other way for me to talk to him, and I've got to talk to him. Would the trip do me any harm? Ought not to, if you're careful. After all, you were born there. Be careful of yourself, though. You've laid a lot of fat around your heart. Oh dear. Do you think it's dangerous? No. You're sound enough. Just don't overstrain yourself. And be careful to keep your temper. 
I will. I most certainly will. Uncle Gus. Yes. Will you come along with me and help me see it through? Oh, I don't think that's necessary. Please, Uncle Gus. I don't trust anybody else. Time you grew up, Waldo. However, I will, this once. Now remember, Waldo told the pilot, the absolute acceleration must never exceed one and one-tenth gs, even in landing. I'll be watching the accelograph the whole time. I've been driving ambulances, said the pilot, for twelve years, and I've never given a patient a rough ride yet. That's no answer. Understand me? One and one-tenth, and it should not even approach that figure until we are under the stratosphere. Quiet, Baldur. Quit snuffling. I get you. Be sure that you do. Your bonuses depend on it. Maybe you'd like to hurt it yourself. I don't like your attitude, my man. If I should die in the tank, you would never get another job. The pilot muttered something. What was that? Waldo demanded sharply. Well, I said it might be worth it. Waldo started to turn red, opened his mouth. Grimes cut in, easy, Waldo. Remember your heart. Yes, Uncle Gus. Grimes snaked his way forward, indicated to the pilot that he wanted him to join him there. Don't pay any attention to anything he says, he advised the man quietly, except what he said about acceleration. He really can't stand much acceleration. He might die in the tank. I still don't think it would be any loss. But I'll be careful. Good. I'm ready to enter the tank, Waldo called out. Will you help me with the straps, Uncle Gus? The tank was not a standard deceleration type, but a modification built for this one trip. The tank was roughly the shape of an oversized coffin and was swung in jimbles to keep it always normal to the axis of absolute acceleration. Waldo floated in water the specific gravity of his fat hulk was low from which he was separated by the usual flexible, gasket tarpaulin. Supporting his head and shoulders was a pad shaped to his contour. A mechanical artificial resuscitator was built into the tank, the back pads being underwater, the breast pads out of the water but retracted out of the way. Grimes stood by with neo-adrenaline, a saddle had been provided for him on the left side of the tank. Baldur was strapped to a shelf on the right side of the tank, he acted as a counterweight to Grimes. Grimes assured himself that all was in readiness, then called out to the pilot, start when you're ready. Okay. He sealed the access port, the entry tube folded itself back against the threshold flat of freehold, freeing the ship. Gently they got underway. Waldo closed his eyes, a look of seraphic suffering came over his face. Uncle Gus, suppose the decalbs fail. No matter. Ambulances store six times the normal reserve. You're sure? When Baldur began to feel weight, he started to whimper. Grimes spoke to him, he quieted down. But presently days later, it seemed to Waldo as the ship sank farther down into the Earth's gravitational field, the absolute acceleration necessarily increased although the speed of the ship had not changed materially. The dog felt the weary heaviness creeping over his body. He did not understand it and he liked it even less, it terrified him. He began to howl. Waldo opened his eyes. Merciful heavens, he moaned. Can't you do something about that? He must be dying. I'll see. Grimes undid his safety belt and swung himself across the tank. The shift in weight changed the balance of the load in the jimbles, Waldo was rocked against the side of the tank. Oh, he panted. Be careful. Take it easy. Grimes caressed the dog's head and spoke to him. When he had calmed down, Grimes grabbed a handful of hide between the dog's shoulders, measured his spot, and jabbed in a hypo. He rubbed the area. There, old fellow. That will make you feel better. Getting back caused Waldo to be rocked again, but he bore it in martyred silence. The ambulance made just one jerky maneuver after it entered the atmosphere. Both Waldo and the dog yelped. Private ship, 
the pilot yelled back. Didn't heed my right of way lights. He muttered something about women drivers. It wasn't his fault, Grimes told Waldo. I saw it. The pilot set them down with exquisite gentleness in a clearing which had been prepared between the highway and Schneider's house. A party of men was waiting for them there, under Grimes' supervision they unslung the tank and carried Waldo out into the open air. The evolution was performed slowly and carefully, but necessarily involved some degree of bumping and uneven movement. Waldo stood it with silent fortitude, but tears leaked out from under his lowered lids. Once outside he opened his eyes and asked, Where is Baldur? I unstrapped him, Grimes informed him, but he did not follow us out. Waldo called out huskily, Here, Baldur. Come to me, boy. Inside the car the dog heard his boss's voice, raised his head, and gave a low bark. He still felt that terrifying sickness, but he inched forward on his belly, attempting to comply. Grimes reached the door in time to see what happened. The dog reached the edge of his shelf and made a grotesque attempt to launch himself in the direction from which he had heard Waldo's voice. He tried the only method of propulsion he knew, no doubt he expected to sail through the door and arrest his flight against the tank on the ground. Instead he fell several feet to the inner floor plates, giving one agonized yelp as he did so, and breaking his fall most clumsily with stiffened forelegs. He lay sprawled where he had landed, making no noise, but not attempting to move. He was trembling violently. Grimes came up to him and examined him superficially, enough to assure him that the beast was not really hurt, then returned to the outside. Baldur's had a little accident, he told Waldo, he's not hurt, but the poor devil doesn't know how to walk. You had best leave him in the ship. Waldo shook his head slightly. I want him with me. Arrange a litter. Grimes got a couple of the men to help him, obtained a stretcher from the pilot of the ambulance, and undertook to move the dog. One of the men said, I don't know as I care for this job. That dog looks vicious. Look t those eyes. He's not, Grimes assured him. He's just scared out of his wits. Here, I'll take his head. What's the matter with him? Same thing as the fat guy. No, he's perfectly well and strong, he's just never learned to walk. This is his first trip to Earth. Well, I'll be a cross-eyed owl. I knew a case like it, volunteered the other. Dog raised in Lunopoly's first week he was on Earth he wouldn't move just squatted down, and howled, and made messes on the floor. So has this one, the first said darkly. They placed Baldur alongside Waldo's tub. With great effort Waldo raised himself on one elbow, reached out a hand, and placed it on the creature's head. The dog licked it, his trembling almost ceased. There. There. Waldo whispered. It's pretty bad, isn't it? Easy, old friend, take it easy. Baldur thumped his tail. It took four men to carry Waldo and two more to handle Baldur. Gramps Schneider was waiting for them at the door of his house. He said nothing as they approached, but indicated that they were to carry Waldo inside. The men with the dog hesitated. Him, too, he said. When the others had withdrawn even Grimes returned to the neighborhood of the ship Schneider spoke again. Welcome, Mr. Waldo Jones. I thank you for your welcome. Grandfather Schneider. The old man nodded graciously without speaking. He went to the side of Baldur's litter. Waldo felt impelled to warn him that the beast was dangerous with strangers, but some odd restraint perhaps the effect of that enervating gravitational field kept him from speaking in time. Then he saw that he need not bother. Baldur had ceased his low whimpering, had raised his head, and was licking Gramps Schneider's chin. His tail thumped cheerfully. Waldo felt a sudden tug of jealousy, the dog had never been known to accept a stranger without Waldo's specific injunction. This was disloyalty treason. But he suppressed the twinge and coolly assessed the incident as a tactical advantage to him. Schneider pushed the dog's face out of the way and went over him thoroughly, prodding, thumping, extending his limbs. He grasped Baldur's muzzle, pushed back his lips, and eyed his gums. 
he peeled back the dog's eyelids. He then dropped the matter and came to Waldo's side. The dog is not sick, he said, his mind confuses. What made it? Waldo told him about Baldur's unusual background. Schneider nodded acceptance of the matter Waldo could not tell whether he had understood or not and turned his attention to Waldo. It is not good for a sprotly lad to lie abed. The weakness how long has it had you? All my life, grandfather. That is not good. Schneider went over him as he had gone over Baldur. Waldo, whose feeling for personal privacy was much more intense than that of the ordinarily sensitive man, endured it for pragmatic reasons. It was going to be necessary, he felt, to wheedle and cajole this strange old creature. It would not do to antagonize him. To divert his own attention from the indignity he chose to submit to, and to gain further knowledge of the old quack, Waldo let his eyes rove the room. The room where they were seemed to be a combination kitchen-living room. It was quite crowded, rather narrow, but fairly long. A fireplace dominated the kitchen end, but it had been bricked up, and a hole for the flue pipe of the base burner had been let into the chimney. The fireplace was lopsided, as an oven had been included in its left side. The corresponding space at the right was occupied by a short counter which supported a tiny sink. The sink was supplied with water by a small hand pump which grew out of the counter. Schneider, Waldo decided, was either older than he looked, which seemed incredible, or he had acquired his house from someone now long dead. The living room end was littered and crowded in the fashion which is simply unavoidable in constricted quarters. Books filled several cases, were piled on the floor, hung precariously on chairs. An ancient wooden desk, crowded with papers and supporting a long obsolete mechanical typewriter, filled one corner. Over it, suspended from the wall, was an ornate clock, carved somewhat like a house. Above its face were two little doors, while Waldo looked at it, a tiny wooden bird painted bright red popped out of the left-hand door, whistled th woo th woo, four times, and popped frantically back into its hole. Immediately thereafter a little grey bird came out of the right-hand door, said cuckoo three times in a leisurely manner, and returned to its hole. Waldo decided that he would like to own such a clock, of course its pendulum and weight movement would not function in freehold but he could easily devise a 1G centrifuge frame to enclose it, wherein it would have a pseudo-earth surface environment. It did not occur to him to fake a pendulum movement by means of a concealed power source, he liked things to work properly. To the left of the clock was an old-fashioned static calendar of paper. The date was obscured, but the letters above the calendar proper were large and legible, New York World's Fair Souvenir of the World of Tomorrow. Waldo's eyes widened a little and went back to something he had noticed before, sticking into a pincushion on the edge of the desk. It was a round plastic button mounted on a pin whereby it could be affixed to the clothing. It was not far from Waldo's eyes, he could read the lettering on it. Free silver. 16 to 1. Schneider must be old. There was a narrow archway, which led into another room. Waldo could not see into it very well. The arch was draped with a fringe curtain of long strings of large ornamental beads. The room was rich with odors, many of them old and musty, but not dirty. Schneider straightened up and looked down at Waldo. There is not wrong with your body. Up get yourself and walk. Waldo shook his head feebly. I am sorry, grandfather, I cannot. You must reach for the power and make it serve you. Try. I am sorry. I do not know how. That is the only trouble. All matters are doubtful, unless one knows. You send your force into the other world. You must reach into the other world and claim it. Where is this other world, grandfather? Schneider seemed a little in doubt as to how to answer this. The other world, he said presently, is the world you do not see. It is here and it is there and it is everywhere. But it is especially here. He touched his forehead. The mind sits in it and sends its messages through it to the body. Wait. He shuffled away to a little cupboard, from which he removed a small jar. It contained a salve, or unguent, which he rubbed on his hands. 
he returned to Waldo and knelt down beside him. Grasping one of Waldo's hands in both of his, he began to knead it very gently. Let the mind be quiet, he directed. Feel for the power. The other world is close and full of power. Feel it. The massage was very pleasant to Waldo's tired muscles. The south, or the touch of the old man's hand, produced a warm, relaxing tingle. If he were younger, thought Waldo, I would hire him as a masseur. He has a magnetic touch. Schneider straightened up again and said, There that betters you? Now you rest while I some coffee make. Waldo settled back contentedly. He was very tired. Not only was the trip itself a nervous strain, but he was still in the grip of this damnable, thick gravitational field, like a fly trapped in honey. Gramps Schneider's ministrations had left him relaxed and sleepy. He must have dozed, for the last thing he remembered was seeing Schneider drop an eggshell into the coffee pot. Then the old man was standing before him, holding the pot in one hand and a steaming cup in the other. He set them down, got three pillows, which he placed at Waldo's back, then offered him the coffee. Waldo laboriously reached out both hands to take it. Schneider held it back. No, he reproved, one hand makes plenty. Do as I showed. Reach into the other world for the strength. He took Waldo's right hand and placed it on the handle of the cup, steadying Waldo's hand with his own. With his other hand he stroked Waldo's right arm gently, from shoulder to fingertips. Again the warm tingle. Waldo was surprised to find himself holding the cup alone. It was a pleasant triumph. At the time he left Earth, seventeen years before, it had been his invariable habit never to attempt to grasp anything with only one hand. In freehold, of course, he frequently handled small objects one-handed, without the use of Waldo's. The years of practice must have improved his control. Excellent. So, feeling rather cocky, he drank the cup full with one hand, using extreme care not to slop it on himself. It was good coffee, too, he was bound to admit quite as good as the sort he himself made from the most expensive syrup extract better, perhaps. When Schneider offered him coffee cake, brown with sugar and cinnamon and freshly ruer med, he swaggeringly accepted it with his left hand, without asking to be relieved of the cup. He continued to eat and drink, between bites and sips resting and steadying his forearms on the edges of the tank. The conclusion of the café clutch seemed a good time to broach the matter of the decalbs. Schneider admitted knowing MacLeod and recalled, somewhat vaguely it seemed, the incident in which he had restored to service MacLeod's broomstick. Hugh Donald is a good boy, he said. Machines I do not like, but it pleasures me to fix things for boys. Grandfather, asked Waldo, will you tell me how you fixed Hugh Donald MacLeod's ship? Have you such a ship you wish me to fix? I have many such ships which I have agreed to fix, but I must tell you that I have been unable to do so. I have come to you to find out the right way. Schneider considered this. That is difficult. I could show you, but it is not so much what you do as how you think about it. That makes only with practice. Waldo must have looked puzzled, for the old man looked at him and added, it is said that there are two ways of looking at everything. That is true and less than true, for there are many ways. Some of them are good ways and some are bad. One of the ancients said that everything either is, or is not. That is less than true, for a thing can both be and not be. With practice one can see it both ways. Sometimes a thing which is for this world is a thing which is not for the other world. Which is important since we live in the other world. We live in the other world. How else could we live? The mind not the brain, but the mind is in the other world, and reaches this world through the body. That is one true way of looking at it, though there are others. Is there more than one way of looking at decalb receptors? Certainly. If I had a set which is not working right brought in here, would you show me how to look at it? It is not needful said Schneider, and I do not like for machines to be in my house. I will draw you a picture. Waldo felt impelled to insist, but he squelched his feeling. You have come here in humility, 
he told himself, asking for instruction. Do not tell the teacher how to teach. Schneider produced a pencil and a piece of paper, on which he made a careful and very neat sketch of the antennae sheaf and main axis of a skycar. The sketch was reasonably accurate as well, although it lacked several essential minor details. These fingers, Schneider said, reach deep into the other world to draw their strength. In turn it passes down this pillar he indicated the access to where it is used to move the car. A fair allegorical explanation, thought Waldo. By considering the other world simply a term for the hypothetical ether, it could be considered correct if not complete. But it told him nothing. Hugh Donald, Schneider went on, was tired and fretting. He found one of the bad truths. Do you mean, Waldo said slowly, that MacLeod's ship failed because he was worried about it? How else? Waldo was not prepared to answer that one. It had become evident that the old man had some quaint superstitions, nevertheless, he might still be able to show Waldo what to do, even though Schneider did not know why. And what did you do to change it? I made no change, I looked for the other truth. But how? We found some chalk marks. Those? They were but to aid me in concentrating my attention in the proper direction. I drew them down so he illustrated with pencil on the sketch and thought how the fingers reached out for power. And so they did. That is all? Nothing more. That is enough. Either, Waldo considered, the old man did not know how he had accomplished the repair, or he had had nothing to do with it sheer and amazing coincidence. He had been resting the empty cup on the rim of his tank, the weight supported by the metal while his fingers merely steadied it. His preoccupation caused him to pay too little heed to it, it slipped from his tired fingers, clattered and crashed to the floor. He was much chagrined. Oh, I'm sorry, Grandfather. I'll send you another. No matter. I will mend. Schneider carefully gathered up the pieces and placed them on the desk. You have tired, he added. That is not good. It makes you lose what you have gained. Go back now to your house, and when you have rested, you can practice reaching for the strength by yourself. It seemed a good idea to Waldo, he was growing very tired, and it was evident that he was to learn nothing specific from the pleasant old fraud. He promised, emphatically and quite insincerely, to practice reaching for strength, and asked Schneider to do him the favor of summoning his bearers. The trip back was uneventful. Waldo did not even have the spirit to bicker with the pilot. Stalemate. Machines that did not work but should, and machines that did work but in an impossible manner. And no one to turn to but one foggy-headed old man. Waldo worked lackadaisically for several days, repeating, for the most part, investigations he had already made rather than admit to himself that he was stuck, that he did not know what to do, that he was, in fact, whipped and might as well call Gleason and admit it. The two bewitched sets of decalbs continued to work whenever activated, with the same strange and incredible flexing of each antenna. Other decalbs which had failed in operation and had been sent to him for investigation still refused to function. Still others, which had not yet failed, performed beautifully without the preposterous fidgeting. For the umpteenth time he took out the little sketch Schneider had made and examined it. There was he thought, just one more possibility, to return again to Earth and insist that Schneider actually do, in his presence, whatever it was he had done which caused the decalbs to work. He knew now that he should have insisted on it in the first place, but he had been so utterly played out by having to fight that devilish thick field that he had not had the will to persist. Perhaps he could have Stevens do it and have the process stereo photoed for a later examination. No. The old man had a superstitious prejudice against artificial images. He floated gently over to the vicinity of one of the inoperative decalbs. What Schneider had claimed to have done was preposterously simple. He had drawn chalk marks down each antenna so, for the purpose of fixing his attention. Then he had gazed down them and thought about them reaching out for power, reaching into the other world, stretching. Baldur began to bark frantically. Shut up! You fool! Waldo snapped, without taking his eyes off the antennae. 
each separate pencil of metal was wiggling, stretching. There was the low, smooth hum of perfect operation. Waldo was still thinking about it when the televisor demanded his attention. He had never been in any danger of cracking up mentally as Rambo had done, nevertheless, he had thought about the matter in a fashion which made his head ache. He was still considerably bemused when he cut in his end of the sound vision. Yes. It was Stevens. Hello, Mr. Jones. Uh, we wondered, that is. Speak up, man. Well, how close are you to a solution? Stevens blurted out. Matters are getting pretty urgent. In what way? There was a partial breakdown in Great New York last night. Fortunately it was not at peak load and the ground crew were able to install spares before the reserves were exhausted, but you can imagine what it would have been like during the rush hour. In my own department the crashes have doubled in the past few weeks, and our underwriters have given notice. We need results pretty quick. You'll get your results, Waldo said loftily. I'm in the final stages of the research. He was actually not that confident, but Stevens irritated him even more than most of the smooth apes. Doubt and reassurance mingled in Stevens's face. I don't suppose you could care to give us a hint of the general nature of the solution. No, Waldo could not. Still it would be fun to pull Stevens's leg. Come close to the pickup, Dr. Stevens. I'll tell you. He leaned forward himself, until they were almost nose to nose in effect. Magic is loose in the world. He cut the circuit at once. Down in the underground labyrinth of North America's home plant, Stevens stared at the black screen. What's the trouble, Chief? McLeod inquired. I don't know. I don't rightly know. But I think that Fatty has slipped his cams, just the way Rambo did. McLeod grinned delightedly. How sweet. I always did think he was a hoot owl. Stevens looked very sober. You had better pray that he hasn't gone nuts. We're depending on him. Now let me see those operation reports. Magic loose in the world. It was as good an explanation as any, Waldo mused. Causation gone haywire, sacrosanct physical laws no longer operative. Magic. As Gramps Schneider had put it, it seemed to depend on the way one looked at it. Apparently Schneider had known what he was talking about, although he naturally had no real grasp of the physical theory involved in the decalbs. Wait a minute now. Wait a minute. He had been going at this problem wrongly perhaps. He had approached it with a certain point of view himself, a point of view which had made him critical of the old man's statements and assumption that he, Waldo, knew more about the whole matter than Schneider did. To be sure he had gone to see Schneider, but he had thought of him as a backcountry hex doctor, a man who might possess one piece of information useful to Waldo, but who was basically ignorant and superstitious. Suppose he were to review the situation from a different viewpoint. Let it be assumed that everything Schneider had to say was coldly factual and enlightened, rather than allegorical and superstitious. He settled himself to do a few hours of hard thinking. In the first place Schneider had used the phrase the other world time and again. What did it mean, literally? A world was a space-time energy continuum, an other world was, therefore, such a continuum, but a different one from the one in which he found himself. Physical theory found nothing repugnant in such a notion, the possibility of infinite numbers of continua was a familiar, orthodox speculation. It was even convenient in certain operations to make such an assumption. Had Gramps Schneider meant that? A literal physical other world? On reflection, Waldo was convinced that he must have meant just that, even though he had not used conventional scientific phraseology. Other world sounds poetical, but to say an additional continuum implies physical meaning. The terms had led him astray. Schneider had said that the other world was all around, here, there, and everywhere. Well, was not that a fair description of a space superposed and in one-to-one -one correspondence? Such a space might be so close to this one that the interval between them was an infinitesimal, yet unnoticed and unreachable, 
just as two planes may be considered as coextensive and separated by an unimaginably short interval, yet be perfectly discrete, one from the other. The other space was not entirely unreachable, Schneider had spoken of reaching into it. The idea was fantastic, yet he must accept it for the purposes of this investigation. Schneider had implied no stated that it was a matter of mental outlook. Was that really so fantastic? If a continuum were an unmeasurably short distance away, yet completely beyond one's physical grasp, would it be strange to find that it was most easily reached through some subtle and probably subconscious operation of the brain? The whole matter was subtle and heaven knew that no one had any real idea of how the brain works. No idea at all. It was laughably insufficient to try to explain the writing of a symphony in terms of the mechanics of colloids. No, nobody knew how the brain worked, one more inexplicable ability in the brain was not too much to swallow. Come to think of it, the whole notion of consciousness and thought was fantastically improbable. All right. So McLeod disabled his skycar himself by thinking bad thoughts, Schneider fixed it by thinking the correct thoughts. Then what? He reached a preliminary conclusion almost at once, by extension, the other DeKalb failures were probably failures on the part of the operators. The operators were probably run down, tired out, worried about something, and in some fashion still not clear they infected, or affected, the DeKalbs with their own troubles. For convenience let us say that the DeKalbs were short-circuited into the other world. Poor terminology, but it helped him to form a picture. Grimes's hypothesis. Run down, tired out, worried about something. Not proved yet, but he felt sure of it. The epidemic of crashes though material was simply an aspect of the general myasthenia caused by short-wave radiation. If that were true. He cut in a sight sound circuit to Earth and demanded to talk with Stevens. Dr. Stevens, he began at once, there is a preliminary precautionary measure which should be undertaken right away. Yes. First, let me ask you this, have you had many failures of decalbs in private ships? What is the ratio? I can't give you exact figures at the moment, Stevens answered, somewhat mystified, but there have been practically none. It's the commercial lines which have suffered. Just as I suspected. A private pilot won't fly unless he feels up to it, but a man with a job goes ahead no matter how he feels. Make arrangements for special physical and psycho examinations for all commercial pilots flying DeKalb type ships. Ground any who are not feeling in tip top shape. Call Dr. Grimes. He'll tell you what to look for. That's a pretty tall order, Mr. Jones. After all, most of those pilots, practically all of them, aren't our employees. We don't have much control over them. That's your problem, Waldo shrugged. I'm trying to tell you how to reduce crashes in the interim before I submit my complete solution. But... Waldo heard no more of the remark, he had cut off when he himself was through. He was already calling over a permanently energized least circuit which kept him in touch with his terrestrial business office with his trained seals. He gave them some very odd instructions orders for books, old books, rare books. Books dealing with magic. Stevens consulted with Gleason before attempting to do anything about Waldo's difficult request. Gleason was dubious. He offered no reason for the advice. None. He told me to look up Dr. Grimes and get his advice as to what specifically to look for. Dr. Grimes. The MD who introduced me to Waldo Mutual Friend. I recall. MMMM, it will be difficult to go about grounding men who don't work for us. Still, I suppose several of our larger customers would co-operate if we asked them to and gave them some sort of a reason. What are you looking so odd about? Stevens told him of Waldo's last, inexplicable statement. Do you suppose it could be affecting him the way it did Dr. Rambo? MMMM could be, I suppose. In which case it would not be well to follow his advice. Have you anything else to suggest? No frankly. Then I see no alternative but to follow his advice. He's our last hope. A forlorn one, perhaps, but our only one. 
Stevens brightened a little. I could talk to Doc Grimes about it. He knows more about Waldo than anyone else. You have to consult him anyway, don't you? Very well do so. Grimes listened to the story without comment. When Stevens had concluded he said, Waldo must be referring to the symptoms I have observed with respect to shortwave exposure. That's easy, you can have the proofs of the monograph I've been preparing. It'll tell you all about it. The information did not reassure Stevens, it helped to confirm his suspicion that Waldo had lost his grip. But he said nothing. Grimes continued, as for the other, Jim, I can't visualize Waldo losing his mind that way. He never did seem very stable to me. I know what you mean. But his paranoid streak is no more like what Rambo succumbed to than chicken pox is like mumps. Matter of fact, one psychosis protects against the other. But I'll go see. You will? Good. Can't go today. Got a broken leg and some children's colds that'll bear watching. Been some polio around. Ought to be able to make it the end of the week though. Doc, why don't you give up GP work? It must be deadly. Used to think so when I was younger. But about 40 years ago I quit treating diseases and started treating people. Since then I've enjoyed it. Waldo indulged in an orgy of reading, gulping the treatises on magic and related subjects as fast as he could. He had never been interested in such subjects before, now, in reading about them with the point of view that there might be and even probably was something to be learned, he found them intensely interesting. There were frequent references to another world, sometimes it was called the other world, sometimes the little world. Read with the conviction that the term referred to an actual, material, different continuum, he could see that many of the practitioners of the forbidden arts had held the same literal viewpoint. They gave directions for using this other world, sometimes the directions were fanciful, sometimes they were baldly practical. It was fairly evident that at least 90 percenter of all magic, probably more, was balderdash and sheer mystification. The mystification extended even to the practitioners, he felt, they lacked the scientific method, they employed a single-valued logic as faulty as the two-valued logic of the obsolete Spencer determinism, there was no suggestion of modern extensional, many-valued logic. Nevertheless, the laws of contiguity, of sympathy and of homeopathy had a sort of twisted lightness to them when considered in relation to the concept of another, different, but accessible, world. A man who had some access to a different space might well believe in a logic in which a thing could be, not be, or be anything with equal ease. Despite the nonsense and confusion which characterized the treatments of magic which dated back to the period when the art was in common practice, the record of accomplishment of the art was impressive. There was Karari and Digitalis, and Quinine, Hypnotism, and Telepathy. There was the hydraulic engineering of the Egyptian priests. Chemistry itself was derived from alchemy, for that matter, most modern science owed its origins to the magicians. Science had stripped off the surplusage, run it through the ringer of two-valued logic, and placed the knowledge in a form in which anyone could use it. Unfortunately, that part of magic which refused to conform to the neat categories of the 19th century methodologists was lopped off and left out of the body of science. It fell into disrepute was forgotten save as fable and superstition. Waldo began to think of the arcane arts as aborted sciences, abandoned before they had been clarified. And yet the manifestations of the sort of uncertainty which had characterized some aspects of magic and which he now attributed to hypothetical additional continua had occurred frequently, even in modern times. The evidence was overwhelming to anyone who approached it with an open mind, poltergeisen, stones falling from the sky, a portation, bewitched persons or, as he thought of them, persons who for some undetermined reason were loci of uncertainty haunted houses, strange fires of the sort that would have once been attributed to salamanders. There were hundreds of such cases, carefully recorded and well vouched for, but ignored by orthodox science as being impossible. They were impossible, by known law, but considered from the standpoint of a coextensive additional continuum, they became entirely credible. He cautioned himself not to consider his tentative hypothesis of the other world as proved, 
nevertheless, it was an adequate hypothesis even if it should develop that it did not apply to some of the cases of strange events. The other space might have different physical laws no reason why it should not. Nevertheless, he decided to proceed on the assumption that it was much like the space he knew. The other world might even be inhabited. That was an intriguing thought. In which case anything could happen through magic. Anything. Time to stop speculating and get down to a little solid research. He had previously regretfully given up trying to apply the formulas of the medieval magicians. It appeared that they never wrote down all of a procedure some essentials so the reports ran and so his experience confirmed was handed down verbally from master to student. His experience with Schneider confirmed this, there were things, attitudes, which must needs be taught directly. He regretfully set out to learn what he must unassisted. Gosh, Uncle Gus, I'm glad to see you. Decided I'd better look in on you. You haven't phoned me in weeks. That's true but I've been working awfully hard, Uncle Gus. Too hard, maybe. Mustn't overdo it. Let me see your tongue. I'm okay. But Waldo stuck out his tongue just the same, Grimes looked at it and felt his pulse. You seem to be ticking all right. Learning anything. Quite a lot. I've about got the matter of the decalbs whipped. That's good. The message you sent Stevens seemed to indicate that you had found some hookup that could be used on my pet problem too. In a way, yes, but around from the other end. It begins to seem as if it was your problem which created Stevens's problem. Hey. I mean it. The symptoms caused by ultra-shortwave radiation may have had a lot to do with the erratic behavior of the decalbs. How? I don't know myself. But I've rigged up a working hypothesis and I'm checking it. Hmmm want to talk about it. Certainly to you. Waldo launched into an account of his interview with Schneider, concerning which he had not previously spoken to Grimes, even though Grimes had made the trip with him. He never, as Grimes knew, discussed anything until he was ready to. The story of the third set of decalbs to be infected with the incredible writhings caused Grimes to raise his eyebrows. Mean to say you caught on to how to do that? Yes indeed. Not how, maybe, but I can do it. I've done it more than once. I'll show you. He drifted away toward one side of the great room where several sets of decalbs, large and small, were mounted, with their controls, on temporary guys. This fellow over on the end, it just came in today. Broke down. I'll give it Gramps Schneider's hocus pocus and fix it. Wait a minute. I forgot to turn on the power. He returned to the central ring which constituted his usual locus and switched on the beam caster. Since the ship itself effectively shielded anything in the room from outer radiation, he had installed a small power plant and caster similar in type to Napa's giant ones, without it he would have had no way to test the reception of the decalbs. He rejoined Grimes and passed down the line of decalbs, switching on the activizing circuits. All save two began to display the uncouth motions he had begun to think of as the Schneider Flex. That one on the far end, he remarked, is in operation but doesn't flex. It has never broken down, so it's never been treated. It's my control, but this one he touched the one in front of him needs fixing. Watch me. What are you going to do? To tell the truth, I don't quite know. But I'll do it. He did not know. All he knew was that it was necessary to gaze down the antennae, think about them reaching into the other world, think of them reaching for power, reaching. The antennae began to squirm. That's all there is to it strictly between ourselves. I learned it from Schneider. They had returned to the center of the sphere, at Grimes's suggestion on the pretext of wanting to get a cigarette. The squirming decalbs made him nervous, but he did not want to say so. How do you explain it? I regard it as an imperfectly understood phenomenon of the other space. I know less about it than Franklin knew about lightning. But I will know I will. I could give Stevens a solution right now for his worries if I knew some way to get around your problem too. I don't see the connection. 
there ought to be some way to do the whole thing through the other space. Start out by radiating power into the other space and pick up it up from there. Then the radiation could not harm human beings. It would never get at them, it would duck around them. I've been working on my caster, but with no luck so far. I'll crack it in time. I hope you do. Speaking of that, isn't the radiation from your own caster loose in this room? Yes. Then I'll put on my shield coat. It's not good for you either. Never mind. I'll turn it off. As he turned to do so there was the sound of a sweet, chirping whistle. Baldur barked. Grimes turned to see what caused it. What, he demanded, have you got there? Hey? Oh, that's my cuckoo clock. Fun, isn't it? Grimes agreed that it was, although he could not see much use for it. Waldo had mounted it on the edge of a light metal hoop which spun with a speed just sufficient to produce a centrifugal force of 1G. I rigged it up, Waldo continued, while I was bogged down in this problem of the other space. Gave me something to do. This other space business I still don't get it. Think of another continuum much like our own and superposed on it the way you might lay one sheet of paper on another. The two spaces aren't identical but they are separated from each other by the smallest interval you can imagine coextensive but not touching usually. There is an absolute one-to-one, -one, point for point correspondence, as I conceive it, between the two spaces, but they are not necessarily the same size or shape. Hey? Come again they would have to be. Not at all. Which has the larger number of points in it? A line an inch long, or a line a mile long? A mile long, of course. No. They have exactly the same number of points. Want me to prove it? I'll take your word for it. But I never studied that sort of math. All right. Take my word for it then. Neither size nor shape is any impediment to setting up a full, point-for-point -point correspondence between two spaces. Neither of the words is really appropriate. Size has to do with a space's own inner structure, its dimensions in terms of its own unique constants. Shape is a matter which happens inside itself or at least not inside our space and has to do with how it is curved, open or closed, expanding or contracting. Grimes shrugged. It all sounds like gibberish to me. He returned to watching the cuckoo clock swing round and round its wheel. Sure it does, Waldo assented cheerfully. We are limited by our experience. Do you know how I think of the other world? The question was purely rhetorical. I think of it as about the size and shape of an ostrich egg, but nevertheless a whole universe, existing side by side with our own, from here to the farthest star. I know that it's a false picture, but it helps me to think about it that way. I wouldn't know, said Grimes, and turned himself around in the air. The compound motion of the clock's pendulum was making him a little dizzy. Say. I thought you turned off the caster. I did, Waldo agreed, and looked where Grimes was looking. The decalbs were still squirming. I thought I did, he said doubtfully, and turned to the caster's control board. His eyes then opened wider. But I did. It is turned off. Then what the devil? Shut up. He had to think think hard. Was the caster actually out of operation? He floated himself over to it, inspected it. Yes, it was dead, dead as the dinosaurs. Just to make sure he went back, assumed his primary Waldos, cut in the necessary circuits, and partially disassembled it. But the decalb still squirmed. The one decalb set which had not been subjected to the Schneider treatment was dead, it gave out no power hum. But the others were working frantically, gathering power from where? He wondered whether or not McLeod had said anything to Gramps Schneider about the casters from which the decalbs were intended to pick up their power. Certainly he himself had not. It simply had not come into the conversation. But Schneider had said something. The other world is close by and full of power. In spite of his own intention of taking the old man literally he had ignored that statement. The other world is full of power. I am sorry I snapped at you, Uncle Gus, 
he said. S all right. But what do you make of that? Looks like you've invented perpetual motion, son. In a way, perhaps. Or maybe we've repealed the law of conservation of energy. Those decalbs are drawing energy that was never before in this world. Hmm, hmm, hmm. To check his belief he returned to the control ring, donned his waldos, cut in a mobile scanner, and proceeded to search the space around the decalbs with the most sensitive pickup for the radio power band he had available. The needles never jumped, the room was dead in the wavelengths to which the decalbs were sensitive. The power came from other space. The power came from other space. Not from his own beam caster, not from Napa's shiny stations, but from other space. In that case he was not even close to solving the problem of the defective decalbs, he might never solve it. Wait, now just what had he contracted to do? He tried to recall the exact words of the contract. There just might be a way around it. Maybe. Yes and this newest cockeyed trick of Gramps Schneider's little pets could have some very tricky aspects. He began to see some possibilities, but he needed to think about it. Uncle Gus. Yes, Waldo. You can go back and tell Stevens that I'll be ready with the answers. We'll get his problem licked, and yours too. In the meantime I've got to do some really heavy thinking, so I want to be by myself, please. Greetings. Mr. Gleason. Quiet, Baldur. Come in. Be comfortable. How do you do, Dr. Stevens? How do you do, Mr. Jones? This, said Gleason, indicating a figure trailing him, is Mr. Harkness, head of our legal staff. Ah, yes indeed. There will be matters of contract to be discussed. Welcome to Freehold, Mr. Harkness. Thank you, Harkness said coldly. Will your attorneys be present? They are present. Waldo indicated a stereo screen. Two figures showed in it, they bowed and murmured polite forms. This is most irregular, Harkness complained. Witnesses should be present in person. Things seen and heard by television are not evidence. Waldo drew his lips back. Do you wish to make an issue of it? Not at all, Gleason said hastily. Never mind, Charles. Harkness subsided. I won't waste your time, gentlemen, Waldo began. We are here in order that I may fulfill my contract with you. The terms are known we will pass over them. He inserted his arms into his primary Waldos. Lined up along the far wall you will see a number of radiant power receptors, commonly called decalbs. Dr. Stevens may, if he wishes, check their serial numbers. No need to. Very well. I shall start my local beam caster, in order that we may check the efficiency of their operation. His Waldos were busy as he spoke. Then I shall activate the receptors, one at a time. His hands pawed the air, a little pair of secondaries switched on the proper switches on the control board of the last set in line. This is an ordinary type, supplied to me by Dr. Stevens, which has never failed in operation. You may assure yourself that it is now operating in the normal manner, if you wish, doctor. I can see that it is. We will call such a receptor a decalb and its operation normal. The small Waldos were busy again. Here we have a receptor which I choose to term a Schneider decalb because of certain treatment it has received the antennae began to move and its operation Schneider type operation. Will you check it, doctor? Okay. You fetched with you a receptor set which has failed. As you can see. Have you been able to make it function? No, I have not. Are you sure? Have you examined it carefully? Quite carefully. Stevens acknowledged sourly. He was beginning to be tired of Waldo's pompous flub dubbery. Very well. I will now proceed to make it operative. Waldo left his control ring, shoved himself over to the vicinity of the defective decalb, and placed himself so that his body covered his exact actions from the sight of the others. He returned to the ring and, using Waldo's, switched on the activating circuit of the decalb. It immediately exhibited Schneider-type activity. 
That is my case, gentlemen, he announced. I have found out how to repair decalbs which become spontaneously inoperative. I will undertake to apply the Schneider treatment to any receptors which you may bring to me. That is included in my fee. I will undertake to train others in how to apply the Schneider treatment. That is included in my fee, but I cannot guarantee that any particular man will profit by my instruction. Without going into technical details I may say that the treatment is very difficult, much harder than it looks. I think that Dr. Stevens will confirm that. He smiled thinly. I believe that completes my agreement with you. Just a moment, Mr. Jones, put in Gleason. Is a decalb foolproof, once it has received the Schneider treatment? Quite. I guarantee it. They went into a huddle while Waldo waited. At last Gleason spoke for them. These are not quite the results we had expected, Mr. Jones, but we agree that you have fulfilled your commission with the understanding that you will Schneider treat any receptors brought to you and instruct others, according to their ability to learn. That is correct. Your fee will be deposited to your account at once. Good. That is fully understood and agreed? I have completely and successfully performed your commission. Correct. Very well then. I have one more thing to show you. If you will be patient a section of the wall folded back, gigantic Waldos reached into the room beyond and drew forth a large apparatus, which resembled somewhat in general form an ordinary set of decalbs, but which was considerably more complicated. Most of the complications were sheer decoration, but it would have taken a skilled engineer a long time to prove the fact. The machine did contain one novel feature, a built-in meter of a novel type whereby it could be set to operate for a predetermined time and then destroy itself, and a radio control whereby the time limit could be varied. Furthermore, the meter would destroy itself and the receptors if tampered with by any person not familiar with its design. It was Waldo's tentative answer to the problem of selling free and unlimited power. But of these matters he said nothing. Small Waldo's had been busy attaching guys to the apparatus, when they were through he said, this gentleman, is an instrument which I choose to call a Jones Schneider decalb. And it is the reason why you will not be in the business of selling power much longer. So, said Gleason. May I ask why? Because, he was told, I can sell it more cheaply and conveniently and under circumstances you cannot hope to match. That is a strong statement. I will demonstrate. Dr. Stevens, you have noted that the other receptors are operating. I will turn them off. The Waldos did so. I will now stop the beamcast and I will ask you to assure yourself, by means of your own instruments, that there is no radiant power, other than ordinary visible light in this room. Somewhat sullenly Stevens did so. The place is dead, he announced some minutes later. Good. Keep your instruments in place, that you may be sure it remains dead. I will now activate my receptor. Little mechanical hands closed the switches. Observe it, doctor. Go over it thoroughly. Stevens did so. He did not trust the readings shown by its instrument board, he attached his own meters in parallel. How about it, James? Gleason whispered. Stevens looked disgusted. The damn thing draws power from nowhere. They all looked at Waldo. Take plenty of time, gentlemen he said grandly. Talk it over. They withdrew as far away as the room permitted and whispered. Waldo could see that Harkness and Gleason were arguing, that Stevens was noncommittal. That suited him. He was hoping that Stevens would not decide to take another look at the fancy gadget he had termed a Jones Schneider decalb. Stevens must not learn too much about it yet. He had been careful to say nothing but the truth about it but perhaps he had not said all of the truth, he had not mentioned that all Schneider-treated decalbs were sources of free power. Rather embarrassing if Stevens should discover that. The meter and destruction device Waldo had purposely made mysterious and complex, but it was not useless. Later he would be able to point out, quite correctly, that without such a device Napa simply could not remain in business. Waldo was not easy. The whole business was a risky gamble, 
he would have much preferred to know more about the phenomena he was trying to peddle, but he shrugged mentally while preserving a smile of smug confidence the business had dragged on several months already, and the power situation really was critical. This solution would do if he could get their names on the dotted line quickly enough. For he had no intention of trying to compete with Napa. Gleason pulled himself away from Stevens and Harkness, came to Waldo. Mr. Jones, can't we arrange this amicably? What have you to suggest? It was quite an hour later that Waldo, with a sigh of relief, watched his guest's ship depart from the threshold flat. A fine caper, he thought, and it had worked, he had gotten away with it. He had magnanimously allowed himself to be persuaded to consolidate, provided he had allowed himself to be quite temperamental about this the contract was concluded at once, no fussing around and fencing between lawyers. Now or never put up or shut up. The proposed contract, he had pointed out virtuously, gave him nothing at all unless his allegations about the jones schneider de Kalb were correct. Gleason considered this point and had decided to sign, had signed. Even then Harkness had attempted to claim that Waldo had been an employee of Napa. Waldo had written that first contract himself a specific commission for a contingent fee. Harkness did not have a leg to stand on, even Gleason had agreed to that. In exchange for all rights to the Jones Schneider de Kalb, for which he agreed to supply drawings wait till Stevens saw, and understood, those sketches, for that he had received the promise of senior stock in Napa, non-voting, but fully paid up and known as Cessable. The lack of active participation in the company had been his own idea. There were going to be more headaches in the power business, headaches aplenty. He could see them coming bootleg designs, means of outwitting the metering, lots of things. Free power had come, and efforts to stop it would in the long run, he believed, be fruitless. Waldo laughed so hard that he frightened Baldur, who set up an excited barking. He could afford to forget Hathaway now. His revenge on Napa contained one potential flaw, he had assured Gleason that the Schneider-treated DeKalbs would continue to operate, would not come unstuck. He believed that to be true simply because he had faith in Gramps Schneider. But he was not prepared to prove it. He knew himself that he did not know enough about the phenomena associated with the other world to be sure that something would, or would not, happen. It was still going to be necessary to do some hard, extensive research. But the other world was a devilishly difficult place to investigate. Suppose, he speculated, that the human race were blind, had never developed eyes. No matter how civilized, enlightened, and scientific the race might have become, it is difficult to see how such a race could ever have developed the concepts of astronomy. They might know of the sun as a cyclic source of energy having a changing, directional character, for the sun is so overpowering that it may be seen with the skin. They would notice it and invent instruments to trap it and examine it. But the pale stars, would they ever notice them? It seemed most unlikely. The very notion of the celestial universe, its silent depths and starlit grandeur, would be beyond them. Even if one of their scientists should have the concept forced on him in such a manner that he was obliged to accept the fantastic, incredible thesis as fact, how then would he go about investigating its details? Waldo tried to imagine an astronomical phototelescope, conceived and designed by a blind man, intended to be operated by a blind man, and capable of collecting data which could be interpreted by a blind man. He gave it up, there were too many hazards. It would take a subtlety of genius far beyond his own to deal with the inescapably tortuous concatenations of inferential reasoning necessary to the solution of such a problem. It would strain him to invent such instruments for a blind man, he did not see how a blind man could ever overcome the difficulties unassisted. In a way that was what Schneider had done for him, alone, he would have bogged down. But even with Schneider's hints the problem of investigating the other world was still much like the dilemma of the blind astronomer. He could not see the other world, only through the Schneider treatment had he been able to contact it. Damnation! How could he design instruments to study it? He suspected that he would eventually have to go back to Schneider for further instruction, but that was an expedient so distasteful that he refused to think much about it. Furthermore, 
Gramps Schneider might not be able to teach him much, they did not speak the same language. This much he did know, the other space was there and it could be reached sometimes by proper orientation of the mind, deliberately as Schneider had taught him, or subconsciously as had happened to McLeod and others. He found the idea distasteful. That thought and thought alone should be able to influence physical phenomena was contrary to the whole materialistic philosophy in which he had grown up. He had a prejudice in favor of order and invariable natural laws. His cultural predecessors, the experimental philosophers who had built up the world of science and its concomitant technology, Galileo, Newton, Edison, Einstein, Steinmetz, Jeans, and their myriad colleagues these men had thought of the physical universe as a mechanism proceeding by inexorable necessity. Any apparent failure to proceed thus was regarded as an error in observation, an insufficient formulation of hypothesis, or an insufficiency of datum. Even the short reign of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle had not changed the fundamental orientation toward order and cosmos, the Heisenberg uncertainty was one they were certain of. It could be formulated, expressed, and a rigorous statistical mechanics could be built from it. In 1958 Horowitz's reformulation of wave mechanics had eliminated the concept. Order and causation were restored. But this damned business. One might as well pray for rain wish on the moon, go to faith healers, surrender whole hog to Bishop Berkeley's sweetly cerebral world in your head. The tree's not a tree, when there's no one about the quad. Waldo was not emotionally wedded to absolute order as Rambo had been, he was in no danger of becoming mentally unbalanced through a failure of his basic conceptions, nevertheless, concern it, it was convenient for things to work the way one expected them to. On order and natural law was based predictability, without predictability it was impossible to live. Clocks should run evenly, water should boil when heat is applied to it, food should nourish, not poison, decalb receptors should work, work the way they were designed to, chaos was insupportable it could not be lived with. Suppose chaos working and the order we thought we detected in the world about us a mere phantasm of the imagination, where would that lead us? In that case, Waldo decided, it was entirely possible that a ten-pound weight did fall ten times as fast as a one-pound weight until the day the audacious Galileo decided in his mind that it was not so. Perhaps the whole meticulous science of ballistics derived from the convictions of a few firm-minded individuals who had sold the notion to the world. Perhaps the very stars were held firm in their courses by the unvarying faith of the astronomers. Orderly Cosmos created out of chaos by mind. The world was flat before geographers decided to think of it otherwise. The world was flat, and the sun, tub size, rose in the east and set in the west. The stars were little lights, studding a pellucid dome which barely cleared the tallest mountains. Storms were the wrath of gods and had nothing to do with the calculus of air masses. A mind-created animism dominated the world then. More recently it had been different. A prevalent convention of materialistic and invariable causation had ruled the world, on it was based the whole involved technology of a machine-served civilization. The machines worked, the way they were designed to work, because everybody believed in them. Until a few pilots, somewhat debilitated by overmuch exposure to radiation, had lost their confidence and infected their machines with uncertainty and thereby let magic loose in the world. He was beginning, he thought to understand what had happened to magic. Magic was the erratic law of an animistic world, it had been steadily pushed back by the advancing philosophy of invariant causation. It was gone now until this new outbreak and its world with it, except for backwaters of superstition. Naturally an experimental scientist reported failure when investigating haunted houses, apportations, and the like, his convictions prevented the phenomena from happening. The deep jungles of Africa might be very different places when there was no white man around to see. The strangely slippery laws of magic might still obtain. Perhaps these speculations were too extreme, nevertheless, they had one advantage which orthodox concepts had not, they included Gramps Schneider's hexing of the decalbs. Any working hypothesis which failed to account for Schneider's and his own ability to think a set of decalbs into operation was not worth a continental. This one did, and it conformed to Gramps's own statements, 
all matters are doubtful and a thing can both be, not be, and be anything. There are many true ways of looking at the same thing. Some ways are good, some are bad. Very well. Accept it. Act on it. The world varied according to the way one looked at it. In that case, thought Waldo, he knew how he wanted to look at it. He cast his vote for order and predictability. He would set the style. He would impress his own concept of the other world on the cosmos. It had been a good start to assure Gleason that the Schneider treated DeKalb's were foolproof. Good. So let it be. They were foolproof. They would never get out of order. He proceeded to formulate and clarify his own concept of the other world in his mind. He would think of it as orderly and basically similar to this space. The connection between the two spaces lay in the neurological system, the cortex, the thalamus, the spinal cord, and the appended nerve system were closely connected with both spaces. Such a picture was consistent with what Schneider had told him and did not conflict with phenomena as he knew it. Wait. If the neurological system lay in both spaces, then that might account for the relatively slow propagation of nerve impulses as compared with electromagnetic progression. Yes. If the other space had a C constant relatively smaller than that of this space, such would follow. He began to feel a calm assurance that it was so. Was he merely speculating or creating a universe? Perhaps he would have to abandon his mental picture of the other space as being the size and shape of an ostrich egg, since a space with a slower propagation of light is not smaller, but larger, than the space he was used to. No. No, wait a second, the size of a space did not depend on its C constant, but on its radius of curvature in terms of its C constant. Since C was a velocity, size was dependent on the notion of time in this case time as entropy rate. Therein lay a characteristic which could be compared between the two spaces, they exchanged energy, they affected each other's entropy. The one which degenerated the more rapidly toward a state of level entropy was the smaller. He need not abandon his picture of the ostrich egg good old egg. The other world was a closed space, with a slow C, a high entropy rate, a short radius, and an entropy state near level a perfect reservoir of power at every point ready to spill over into this space wherever he might close the interval dot to its inhabitants, if any, it might seem to be hundreds of millions of light years around, to him it was an ostrich egg, turgid to bursting with power. He was already beginning to think of ways of checking his hypothesis. If, using a Schneider de Kalb, he were to draw energy at the highest rate he could manage, would he affect the local potential? Would it establish an entropy gradient? Could he reverse the process by finding a way to pump power into the other world? Could he establish different levels at different points and thereby check for degeneration toward level, maximum entropy? Did the speed of nerve impulse propagation furnish a clue to the sea of the other space? Could such a clue be combined with the entropy and potential investigations to give a mathematical picture of the other space, in terms of its constants and its age? He said about it. His untrammeled, wild speculations had produced some definite good, he'd tied down at least one line of attack on that other space, he'd devised a working principle for his blind man's telescope mechanism. Whatever the truth of the thing was, it was more than a truth, it was a complete series of new truths. It was the very complexity of that series of new truths the truths, the characteristic laws, that were inherent properties of the other space plus the new truth laws resultant from the interaction of the characteristics of the other space with normal space. No wonder Rambo had said anything could happen. Almost anything could, in all probability, by a proper application and combination of the three sets of laws, the laws of our space, the laws of other space, and the coordinate laws of both spaces. But before theoreticians could begin work, new data were most desperately needed. Waldo was no theoretician, a fact he admitted left-handedly in thinking of theory as impractical and unnecessary, time waste for him as a consulting engineer. Let the smooth apes work it out. But the consulting engineer had to find out one thing, would the Schneider de Kalbs continue to function uninterruptedly as guaranteed? If not, what must be done to assure continuous function? 
The most difficult and the most interesting aspect of the investigation had to do with the neurological system in relation to other space. Neither electromagnetic instruments nor neural surgery was refined enough to do accurate work on the levels he wished to investigate. But he had Waldos. The smallest Waldos he had used up to this time were approximately half an inch across their palms with microscanners to match, of course. They were much too gross for his purpose. He wished to manipulate living nerve tissue, examine its insulation and its performance in situ. He used the tiny Waldos to create tinier ones. The last stage was tiny metal blossoms hardly an eighth of an inch across. The helices in their stems, or forearms, which served them as pseudo-muscles, could hardly be seen by the naked eye but, then, he used scanners. His final team of Waldos used for nerve and brain surgery varied in succeeding stages from mechanical hands nearly life-size down to these fairy digits which could manipulate things much too small for the eye to see. They were mounted in bank to work in the same locus. Waldo controlled them all from the same primaries, he could switch from one size to another without removing his gauntlets. The same change in circuits which brought another size of Waldos under control automatically accomplished the change in sweep of scanning to increase or decrease the magnification so that Waldo always saw before him in his stereo receiver a life-size image of his other hands. Each level of Waldos had its own surgical instruments, its own electrical equipment. Such surgery had never been seen before, but Waldo gave that aspect little thought, no one had told him that such surgery was unheard of. He established, to his own satisfaction, the mechanism whereby shortwave radiation had produced a deterioration in human physical performance. The synapses between dendrites acted as if they were points of leakage. Nerve impulses would sometimes fail to make the jump, would leak off to where? To other space, he was sure. Such leakage seemed to establish a preferred path, a canalization, whereby the condition of the victim became steadily worse. Motor action was not lost entirely, as both paths were still available, but efficiency was lost. It reminded him of a metallic electrical circuit with a partial ground. An unfortunate cat, which had become dead undergoing the experimentation, had supplied him with much of his data. The kitten had been born and raised free from exposure to power radiation. He subjected it to heavy exposure and saw it acquire a myasthenia nearly as complete as his own while studying in minute detail what actually went on in its nerve tissues. He felt quite sentimental about it when it died. Yet, if Gramps Schneider were right, human beings need not be damaged by radiation. If they had the wit to look at it with the proper orientation, the radiation would not affect them, they might even draw power out of the other world. That was what Gramps Schneider had told him to do. That was what Gramps Schneider had told him to do. Gramps Schneider had told him he need not be weak. That he could be strong. 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 He had never thought of it. Schneider's friendly ministrations to him, his advice about overcoming the weakness, he had ignored, had thrown off as inconsequential. His own weakness his own peculiarity which made him different from the smooth apes, he had regarded as a basic implicit fact. He had accepted it as established when he was a small child, a final unquestioned factor. Naturally he had paid no attention to Schneider's words in so far as they referred to him. To be strong. To stand alone to work, to run. Why, he, he could, he could go down to earth's surface without fear. He wouldn't mind the field. They said they didn't mind it, they even carried things great, heavy things. Everybody did. They threw things. He made a sudden convulsive movement in his primary Waldos, quite unlike his normal, beautifully economical rhythm. The secondaries were oversize, as he was making a new setup. The guys tore loose, a brace plate banged against the wall. Baldur was snoozing nearby. He pricked up his ears, looked around, then turned his face to Waldo, questioning him. Waldo glared at him and the dog whined. Shut up. The dog quieted and apologized with his eyes. Automatically he looked over the damage not much, but he would have to fix it. Strength. Why, if he were strong, he could do anything anything. 
Number 6 Extension Waldos and Some New Guys Strong Absent-mindedly he shifted to the number 6 Waldos. Strength. He could even meet women be stronger than they were. He could swim. He could ride. He could fly a ship run, jump. He could handle things with his bare hands. He could even learn to dance. Strong. He would have muscles. He could break things. He could he could. He switched to the great Waldos with hands the size of a man's body. Strong they were strong. With one giant Waldo he hauled from the stockpile a quarter-inch steel plate, held it up, and shook it. A booming rumble. He shook it again. Strong. He took it in both Waldos, bent it double. The metal buckled unevenly. Convulsively he crumpled it like waste paper between the two huge palms. The grinding racket raised hackles on Baldur, he himself had not been aware of it. He relaxed for a moment, gasping. There was sweat on his forehead, blood throbbed in his ears. But he was not spent, he wanted something heavier, stronger. Cutting to the adjoining storeroom he selected an L-beam twelve feet long, shoved it through to where the giant hands could reach it, and cut back to them. The beam was askew in the port, he wrenched it loose knocking a big dent in the port frame. He did not notice it. The beam made a fine club in the gross fist. He brandished it. Baldur backed away, placing the control ring between himself and the great hands. Power. Strength. Smashing, unbeatable strength. With a spastic jerk he checked his swing just before the beam touched the wall. No but he grabbed the other end of the club with the left Waldo and tried to bend it. The big Waldos were built for heavy work, but the beam was built to resist. He strained inside the primaries, strove to force the great fists to do his will. A warning light flashed on his control board. Blindly he kicked in the emergency overload and persisted. The hum of the Waldos and the rasp of his own breath were drowned out by the harsh scrape of metal on metal as the beam began to give way. Exulting, he bore down harder in the primaries. The beam was bending double when the Waldos blew out. The right-hand tractors let go first, the fist flung open. The left fist, relieved of the strain, threw the steel from it. It tore its way through the thin bulkhead, making a ragged hole, crashed and clanged in the room beyond. But the giant Waldos were inanimate junk. He drew his soft pink hands from the Waldos and looked at them. His shoulders heaved, and racking sobs pushed up out of him. He covered his face with his hands, the tears leaked out between his fingers. Baldur whimpered and edged in closer. On the control board a bell rang persistently. The wreckage had been cleared away and an adequate, neat patch covered the place where the L-beam had made its own exit. But the giant Waldos had not yet been replaced, their frame was uninhabited. Waldo was busy rigging a strength tester. It had been years since he had paid any attention to the exact strength of his body. He had had so little use for strength, he had concentrated on dexterity, particularly on the exact and discriminating control of his namesakes. In the selective, efficient and accurate use of his muscles he was second to none, he had control he had to have. But he had had no need for strength. With the mechanical equipment at hand it was not difficult to jerry-rig a device which would register strength of grip as pounds force on a dial. A spring-loaded scale and a yoke to act on it sufficed. He paused and looked at the contrivance. He need only take off the primary Waldos, place his bare hand on the grip, bear down and he would know. Still he hesitated. It felt strange to handle anything so large with his bare hand. Now. Reach into the other world for power. He closed his eyes and pressed. He opened them. Fourteen pounds less than he used to have. But he had not really tried yet. He tried to imagine Gramps Schneider's hands on his arm, that warm tingle. Power. Reach out and claim it. Fourteen pounds, fifteen seventeen, eighteen, twenty, twenty-one. He was winning. He was winning. Both his strength and his courage failed him, in what order he could not say. The needle spun back to zero, he had to rest. 
Had he really shown exceptional strength or was 21 pounds of grip simply normal for him at his present age and weight? A normally strong and active man, he knew, should have a grip on the order of 150 pounds. Nevertheless, 21 pounds of grip was 6 pounds higher than he had ever before managed on test. Try, again. 10, 11, 12. 13. The needle hesitated. Why? He had just started this was ridiculous. 14. There it stopped. No matter how he strained and concentrated his driving will he could not pass that point. Slowly, he dropped back from it. 16 pounds was the highest he managed in the following days. 21 pounds seemed to have been merely a fluke, a good first effort. He ate bitterness. But he had not reached his present position of wealth and prominence by easy surrender. He persisted, recalling carefully just what Schneider had said to him, and trying to feel the touch of Schneider's hands. He told himself now that he really had been stronger under Schneider's touch. But that he had failed to realize it because of the earth's heavy field. He continued to try. In the back of his mind he knew that he must eventually seek out Gramps Schneider and ask his help if he did not find the trick alone. But he was extremely reluctant to do so, not because of the terrible trip it entailed though that would ordinarily have been more than enough reason but because if he did so and Schneider was not able to help him, then there would be no hope, no hope at all. It was better to live with disappointment and frustration than to live without hope. He continued to postpone it. Waldo paid little attention to earth time, he ate and slept when he pleased. He might catch a cat nap at any time, however, at fairly regular intervals he slept for longer periods. Not in a bed, of course. A man who floats in air has no need for a bed. But he did make it a habit to guy himself into place before undertaking eight hours of solid sleep, as it prevented him from casual drifting in random air currents which might carry him, unconscious, against controls or switches. Since the obsession to become strong had possessed him he had frequently found it necessary to resort to soporifics to ensure sleep. Dr. Rambo had returned and was looking for him. Rambo crazy and filled with hate. Rambo, blaming his troubles on Waldo. He was not safe, even in freehold, as the crazy physicist had found out how to pass from one space to another. There he was now. Just his head, poked through from the other world. I'm going to get you, Waldo. He was gone no, there he was behind him. Reaching, reaching out with hands that were writhing antennae. You, Waldo. But Waldo's own hands were the giant Waldo's, he snatched at Rambo. The big Waldo's went limp. Rambo was at him, was on him, he had him around the throat. Gramps Schneider said in his ear, in a voice that was calm and strong, reach out for the power my son. Feel it in your fingers. Waldo grabbed at the throttling fingers, strained, tried. They were coming loose. He was winning. He would stuff Rambo back into the other world and keep him there. There. He had one hand free. Baldur was barking frantically, he tried to tell him to shut up, to bite Rambo, to help. The dog continued to bark. He was in his own home in his own great room. Baldur let out one more yipe. Quiet. He looked himself over. When he had gone to sleep he had been held in place by four light guys, opposed like the axes of a tetrahedron. Two of them were still fastened to his belt, he swung loosely against the control ring. Of the other two, one had snapped off at his belt, its end floated a few feet away. The fourth had been broken in two places, near his belt and again several feet out, the severed piece was looped loosely around his neck. He looked the situation over. Study as he might, he could conceive no way in which the guys could have been broken save by his own struggles in the nightmare. The dog could not have done it, he had no way to get a purchase. He had done it himself. The lines were light, being intended merely as stays. Still. It took him a few minutes to rig a testing apparatus which would test pull instead of grip, the yoke had to be reversed. When it was done he cut in a medium Waldo pair, 
fastened the severed pieces of line to the tester, and, using the waldo, pulled. The line parted at 212 pounds. Hastily, but losing time because of nervous clumsiness, he re-rigged the tester for grip. He paused, whispered softly, now is the time, gramps, and bore down on the grip. 20 pounds 21. 25. Up past 30. He was not even sweating. 35 40, dash 1, dash 2, dash 3. 45. And dash 6. And a half. 47 pounds. With a great sigh he let his hand relax. He was strong. Strong. When he had somewhat regained his composure, he considered what to do next. His first impulse was to call Grimes, but he suppressed it. Soon enough when he was sure of himself. He went back to the tester and tried his left hand. Not as strong as his right, but almost nearly 45 pounds. Funny thing, he didn't feel any different. Just normal, healthy. No sensation. He wanted to try all of his muscles. It would take too long to rig testers for kick, and shove, and back lift, and, oh, a dozen others. He needed a field, that was it, a 1G field. Well, there was the reception room, it could be centrifuged. But its controls were in the ring and it was long corridors away. There was a nearer one, the centrifuge for the cuckoo clock. He had rigged the wheel with a speed control as an easy way to regulate the clock. He moved back to the control ring and stopped the turning of the big wheel, the clockwork was disturbed by the sudden change, the little red bird popped out, said, th woo th woo once, hopefully, and subsided. Carrying in his hand a small control panel radio hooked to the motor which impelled the centrifuge wheel, he propelled himself to the wheel and placed himself inside, planting his feet on the inner surface of the rim and grasping one of the spokes, so that he would be in a standing position with respect to the centrifugal force, once it was impressed. He started the wheel slowly. Its first motion surprised him and he almost fell off. But he recovered himself and gave it a little more power. All right so far. He speeded it up gradually, triumph spreading through him as he felt the pull of the pseudo-gravitational field felt his legs grow heavy, but still strong. He let it out, one full G. He could take it. He could, indeed. To be sure, the force did not affect the upper part of his body so strongly as the lower, as his head was only a foot or so from the point of rotation. He could fix that, he squatted down slowly, hanging on tight to the spoke. It was all right. But the wheel swayed and the motor complained. His unbalanced weight, that far out from the center of rotation, was putting too much of a strain on a framework intended to support a cuckoo clock and its counterweight only. He straightened up with equal caution, feeling the fine shove of his thigh muscles and calves. He stopped the wheel. Baldur had been much perturbed by the whole business. He had almost twisted his neck off trying to follow the motions of Waldo. He still postponed calling Grimes. He wanted to arrange for some selective local controls on the centrifuging of the reception room, in order to have a proper place in which to practice standing up. Then he had to get the hang of this walking business, it looked easy, but he didn't know. Might be quite a trick to learn it. Thereafter he planned to teach Baldur to walk. He tried to get Baldur into the cuckoo clock wheel, but the dog objected. He wiggled free and retreated to the farthest part of the room. No matter when he had the beast in the reception room he would damn well have to learn to walk. Should have seen to it long ago. A big brute like that, and couldn't walk. He visualized a framework into which the dog could be placed which would force him to stand erect. It was roughly equivalent to a baby's toddler, but Waldo did not know that. He had never seen a baby's toddler. Uncle Gus. Oh, hello, Waldo. How you been? Fine. Look, Uncle Gus, could you come up to Freehold right away? Grimes shook his head. Sorry. My bus is in the shop. Your bus is too slow anyhow. Take a taxi, or get somebody to drive you. 
and have you insult em when we get there? Huh. I'll be sweet as sugar. Well, Jimmy Stevens said something yesterday about wanting to see you. Waldo grinned. Get him. I'd like to see him. I'll try. Call me back. Make it soon. Waldo met them in the reception room, which he had left uncentrifuged. As soon as they came in he started his act. My, I'm glad you're here. Dr. Stevens could you fly me down to Earth right away? Some things come up. Why I suppose so. Let's go. Wait a minute, Waldo. Jimmy's not prepared to handle you the way you have to be handled. I'll have to chance it, Uncle Gus. This is urgent. But. No buts. Let's leave at once. They hustled Baldur into the ship and tied him down. Grimes saw to it that Waldo's chair was tilted back in the best approximation of a deceleration rig. Waldo settled himself into it and closed his eyes to discourage questions. He sneaked a look and found Grimes grimly silent. Stevens made very nearly a record trip, but set them down quite gently on the parking flat over Grimes's home. Grimes touched Waldo's arm. How do you feel? I'll get someone and we'll get you inside. I want to get you to bed. Can't do that, Uncle Gus. Things to do. Give me your arm, will you? Hey. But Waldo reached for the support requested and drew himself up. I'll be all right now, I guess. He let go the physician's arm and started for the door. Will you untie Baldur? Waldo. He turned around, grinning happily. Yes, Uncle Gus, it's true. I'm not weak anymore. I can walk. Grimes took hold of the back of one of the seats and said shakily, Waldo, I'm an old man. You ought not to do things like this to me. He wiped at his eyes. Yes, agreed Stevens, it's a damn dirty trick. Waldo looked blankly from one face to the other. I'm sorry, he said humbly. I just wanted to surprise you. It's all right. Let's go downside and have a drink. You can tell us about it then. All right. Come on, Baldur. The dog got up and followed after his master. He had a very curious gait, Waldo's trainer gadget had taught him to pace instead of trot. Waldo stayed with Grimes for days, gaining strength, gaining new reflex patterns, building up his flabby muscles. He had no setbacks, the myasthenia was gone. All he required was conditioning. Grimes had forgiven him at once for his unnecessarily abrupt and spectacular revelation of his cure, but Grimes had insisted that he take it easy and become fully readjusted before he undertook to venture out unescorted. It was a wise precaution. Even simple things were hazards to him. Stairs, for example. He could walk on the level but going downstairs had to be learned. Going up was not so difficult. Stevens showed up one day, let himself in, and found Waldo alone in the living room, listening to a stereo show. Hello, Mr. Jones. Oh hello, Dr. Stevens. Waldo reached down hastily, fumbled for his shoes, zipped them on. Uncle Gus says I should wear them all the time, he explained. Everybody does. But you caught me unawares. Oh, that's no matter. You don't have to wear them in the house. Where's Doc? Gone for the day. Don't you, really? Seems to me my nurses always wore shoes. Oh yes, everybody does but there's no law to make you. Then I'll wear them. But I can't say that I like them. They feel dead, like a pair of disconnected Waldos. But I want to learn how. How to wear shoes. How to act like people act. It's really quite difficult, he said seriously. Stevens felt a sudden insight, a welling of sympathy for this man with no background and no friends. It must be odd and strange to him. He felt an impulse to confess something which had been on his mind with respect to Waldo. You really are strong now, aren't you? Waldo grinned happily. Getting stronger every day. I gripped 200 pounds this morning. And see how much fat I've worked off. 
you're looking fit, all right. Here's a funny thing. Ever since I first met you I've wished to high heaven that you were as strong as an ordinary man. You really did? Why? Well. I think you will admit that you used some pretty poisonous language to me, one time and another. You had me riled up all the time. I wanted you to get strong so that I could just beat the hell out of you. Waldo had been walking up and down, getting used to his shoes. He stopped and faced Stevens. He seemed considerably startled. You mean you wanted to fist fight me? Exactly. You used language to me that a man ought not to use unless he is prepared to back it up with his fists. If you had not been an invalid I would have pasted you one, oh, any number of times. Waldo seemed to be struggling with a new concept. I think I see, he said slowly. Well all right. On the last word he delivered a roundhouse swipe with plenty of power behind it. Stevens was not in the least expecting it, it happened to catch him on the button. He went down, out cold. When he came to he found himself in a chair. Waldo was shaking him. Wasn't that right, he said anxiously. What did you hit me with? My hand. Wasn't that right? Wasn't that what you wanted? Wasn't that what I he still had little bright lights floating in front of his eyes, but the situation began to tickle him. Look here is that your idea of the proper way to start a fight. Isn't it? Stevens tried to explain to him the etiquette of fisticuffs, contemporary American. Waldo seemed puzzled, but finally he nodded. I get it. You have to give the other man warning. All right get up, and we'll do it over. Easy? easy. Wait a minute. You never did give me a chance to finish what I was saying. I was sore at you, but I'm not anymore. That is what I was trying to tell you. Oh, you were utterly poisonous, there is no doubt about that. But you couldn't help being. I don't mean to be poisonous, Waldo said seriously. I know you don't, and you're not. I rather like you now now that you're strong. Do you really? Yes, I do. But don't practice any more of those punches on me. I won't. But I didn't understand. But, do you know, Dr. Stevens, it's... Call me Jim. Jim. It's a very hard thing to know just what people do expect. There is so little pattern to it. Take belching, I didn't know it was forbidden to burp when other people are around. It seems obviously necessary to me. But Uncle Gus says not. Stevens tried to clear up the matter for him not too well, as he found that Waldo was almost totally lacking in any notion, even theoretical, of social conduct. Not even from fiction had he derived a concept of the intricacies of Maury's, as he had read almost no fiction. He had ceased reading stories in his early boyhood because he lacked the background of experience necessary to appreciate fiction. He was rich, powerful, and a mechanical genius, but he still needed to go to kindergarten. Waldo had a proposition to make. Jim, you've been very helpful. You explain these things better than Uncle Gus does. I'll hire you to teach me. Stevens suppressed a slight feeling of pique. Sorry. I've got a job that keeps me busy. Oh, that's all right. I'll pay you better than they do. You can name your own salary. It's a deal. Stevens took a deep breath and sighed. You don't understand. I'm an engineer and I don't hire out for personal service. You can't hire me. Oh, I'll help you all I can, but I won't take money for it. What's wrong with taking money? The question, Stevens thought, was stated wrongly. As it stood it could not be answered. He launched into a long, involved discussion of professional and business conduct. He was really not fitted for it, Waldo soon bogged down. I'm afraid I don't get it. But see here could you teach me how to behave with girls? Uncle Gus says he doesn't dare take me out in company. Well, I'll try. I'll certainly try. But, Waldo. I came over to see you about some of the problems we're running into at the plant. 
about this theory of the two spaces that you were telling me about. It's not theory, it's fact. All right. What I want to know is this, when do you expect to go back to Freehold and resume research? We need some help. Go back to Freehold? I haven't any idea. I don't intend to resume research. You don't? But, my heavens, you haven't finished half the investigations you outlined to me. You fellows can do em. I'll help out with suggestions, of course. Well maybe we could interest Gramps Schneider, Stevens said doubtfully. I would not advise it, Waldo answered. Let me show you a letter he sent me. He left and fetched it back. Here. Stevens glanced through it. Your generous offer of your share in the new power project I appreciate, but, truthfully, I have no interest in such things and would find the responsibility a burden. As for the news of your new strength I am happy, but not surprised. The power of the other world is his who would claim it there was more to it. It was written in a precise Spencerian hand, a trifle shaky, the rhetoric showed none of the colloquialisms with which Schneider spoke. Hmm I think I see what you mean. I believe, Waldo said seriously, that he regards our manipulations with gadgets as rather childish. I suppose. Tell me, what do you intend to do with yourself? Me? I don't know, exactly. But I can tell you this, I'm going to have fun. I'm going to have lots of fun. I'm just beginning to find out how much fun it is to be a man. His dresser tackled the other slipper. To tell you just why I took up dancing would be a long story, he continued. I want details. Hospital calling, someone in the dressing room said. Tell M I'll be right there, fast. Suppose you come in tomorrow afternoon, he added to the woman reporter. Can you? Right. A man was shouldering his way through the little knot around him. Waldo caught his eye. Hello, Stanley. Glad to see you. Hello, Waldo. Gleason pulled some papers out from under his cape and dropped them in the dancer's lap. Brought these over myself as I wanted to see your act again. Like it. Swell. Waldo grinned and picked up the papers. Where is the dotted line? Better read them first, Gleason cautioned him. Oh shucks, no. If it suits you, it suits me. Can I borrow your stylus? A worried little man worked his way up to them. About that recording, Waldo. We've discussed that, Waldo said flatly. I only perform before audiences. We've combined it with the Warm Springs benefit. That's different. Okay. While you're about it, take a look at this layout. It was a reduction, for a 24 sheet. The Great Waldo. And his troupe. With the opening date and theater left blank, but with a picture of Waldo, as Harlequin, poised high in the air. Fine, Sam, fine. Waldo nodded happily. Hospital calling again. I'm ready now, Waldo answered, and stood up. His dresser draped his street cape over his lean shoulders. Waldo whistled sharply. Here, Baldur. Come along. At the door he stopped an instant, and waved. Good night, fellows. Good night, Waldo. They were all such grand guys. And. Sabooks.